the, the aughts are already being considered significant. So this is who we are, uh, just so you can see our faces in case you don't see our videos as the, the presentation goes forward. Um, I'm on the left and, and Frank there is on the right. I'm gonna start out today about talking about some of the challenges of preserving the recent past um, and giving you some hints for identifying significant um, architecture and properties of the, of the recent past. And then Frank will take over and give you some case studies um, that will hopefully inspire you to advocate for preservation locally. So let's start with the challenges. Uh, challenges for preserving modernism and the most recent past abound, but they all kind of boil down to these three topics, likability, physicality, and designation. I'll talk about each briefly. So one of the biggest issues with resources of the recent past is likability. This is the Rouen Center in Des Moines. Um, it was built in 1975, and it's still today often referred to as that ugly, rusty tower. The weathering steel, which is Corten steel, was developed in 1930s for use in railroad cars. Um, that rusty appearance is, is truly a protective layer of corrosion for the building. So why is architecture of the recent past so unlikable? Well, there are many reasons. First and foremost, tastes change. Uh, urban renewal went through large swaths of late 1800s and early 1900s architecture because that architecture was seen as outdated and passe. We're having the same issues today uh, with uh, demolition of the recent past. The recent past also comes with baggage. It's a reminder of urban renewal, uh, the Vietnam War. It might be a reminder of the energy crisis and gas lines of the 70s or the political and economic upheaval of the 1980s. Um, and it's it's kind of stuck in this middle, middle child architectural limbo uh, in relation to potential cheerleaders for the properties. The people who applauded the architecture when it was built um, are getting older, they're passing on. Uh, the young people coming up behind who are looking at it as kind of cool retro uh, may not have the means to be a cheerleader or steward for the, the resource. In the middle are the people who grew up with the buildings, um, and they may not be especially fond of it. I swore I would never preserve a 1960s ranch because I grew up in a 1960s ranch. Uh, my, my thoughts on that have changed, though. Um, so how do we build a case for something that just simply isn't likable? The next challenge is physicality. Uh, this is the College of Design at Iowa State University. Um, it was built in 1978, and I spent a good part of my undergraduate education in this building. And um, you know, physicality is, is part of likability. Uh, I was not a huge fan of this building. Um, but think about how the, the difficulties of reusing buildings of, of this age might be. This building, you had these angled corners that kind of um, were dead spaces within the building. It has that, that huge atrium down the middle, um, massive concrete structure um, that would be difficult to modify uh, if it were being reused. Other aspects of physicality of the recent past to be aware of, lifespan. The average age of a building can, can run 50 to 100 years. Um, but the systems within it are going to age out well before that. They may only last 30 years. Uh, and so when people begin dis discussing doing complete system overhauls and that cost gets too huge, they'd rather just demolish the building and, and rebuild. Uh, location is another part of physicality. Oftentimes the land on which a building is built is worth much more than the building itself. Um, and then there's the material fa failure. So innovative designs of the, the late 20th century and the materials don't always hold up. Uh, you recall the, the Corten steel building or the Rouen Center. Um, in addition to staining nearby surfaces, that corrosion can actually go too far. There's an example in Atlanta, the, the Omni Coliseum. It was built in 1972 out of Corten steel and it never stopped corroding. Uh, the patina went well beyond what it was meant to do and eventually it had holes in the surface. It was torn down at 25 years old. The last challenge is designation. So over the last 50 years, they've given us buildings that are, aren't especially likable. 
and they have physical conditions that aren't especially favorable for long-term preservation. We all know our best, our best preservation tool is local designation, but whether you look at local designation or national register designation, it's not really a shoe in for recent past properties. This is the Chart House restaurant. It's in Rancho Mirage, California. It was built in 1978. Um, and it was actually locally designated when it was less than 30 years of age. But just as they were looking at getting it on the National Register, uh, it, was, it was a victim of arson. And the, the city had long discussions about whether or not the, the building could hold up to the integrity um, needs of National Register listing. Unfortunately, they decided not to go forward with the listing. Uh, on the National Register and uh, the building ended up being demolished in, in 2013. So some of the issues that you're dealing with with designation, of course, is age. Um, even though there are some sites like the World Trade Center site in New York City, um, they're considered eligible for listing on the National Register you know, within a, a couple of years of 9-11. Um, that 50-year that rule is often seen as a hard and fast rule, um, but it's not. You need to only provide context to show how something can be exceptionally significant. Um, and believe me, if you're looking at designating a building like the chart house here, um, it's, it's likely exceptionally significant. You just need to explain it in your context. Another issue with designation, of course, is integrity, which is what happened with the chart house. Um, even if you know you have something that's significant, how do you assess the integrity when, um, the original material has been replaced, but that was mass produced material. Does that really matter if it has new material that was exactly the same? Um, or what happens if it has inherent material failures, which is common in recent past architecture because so much innovation was happening in the last half of the 20th century? How important is integrity when you have a one of a kind like the chart house? And finally, for designation, and this is probably the biggest one for post-war buildings of all kind, is just the sheer number. Um, the challenge isn't that it's unique, it's that you're trying to find a needle in a, a suburban haystack. Um, how, do you, how do you know what is significant and what is not? So how do you get past these challenges? Well, you have to get to know your resources. So I'm going to spend the bulk of my time talking about identification, and this is um, going to be significant some context. I'm going to talk about integrity, and then we're going to venture into some of the styles of the last 50 years, um, just to see, just so that you can see what's coming on the horizon for for historic properties. We'll start with context. The first part of identifying historic resources always to understand its significance within the context in which it was created. When you look back at your community's history. What stories are people still talking about today that date to the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even the aughts? Uh, that's where you're going to find your significant historic resources. And you need to be able to tell that story. Keep in mind, you don't need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to context. There's a lot of context out there already for resources of the recent past. These are just three context documents that the National Park Service has put together related to uh, resources from the last 50, 60 years. Um, all of that can help inform your local preservation efforts. So I'm gonna go into the National Register criteria. Um, and what I want you to do as I'm talking about these is to think about them with an eye on the last five decades of, of architecture. National Register Criterion A. These are those properties that are associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history. I like to think of it as just simply events and trends. So think about the resources in your communities that might have significance based on the late 20th century. We've already mentioned a lot of these. The energy crisis, the political and economic crises. Um, uh, in more recent years, we're talking about things like the World Trade Center site or um, domestic terrorism things. Remember, it's not always just happy history. Um, here are some examples, all from uh, Minnesota on this slide. Um, on the left, you have Cedar Square West. Uh, it was listed on the National Register 
under criterion C, but also under criterion A for community planning and development. Um, it was a national model for an, uh, an experimental HUD program called New Towns in Town. Um, and it was the larger of the two uh, facilities that were ever built. It's historically tied to immigrant housing as part of urban renewal efforts. And it was built in 1973 and listed in 2010. On the upper right is University Grove. This is actually the, the Livermore House in University Grove. It's a, it's a Ralph Rapson design from 1968. So it's, it's still kind of on the, the cusp of, of the mid-century modern movement. Um, to my knowledge, University Grove um, has not been fully evaluated for National Register listing, um, but they did look at local designation for a while. It's a collection of over a hundred architect designed homes uh, dating from the 1930s all the way to the 1970s. So what's the important story here? The university set aside this land for faculty and for, for uh, university staff and um, it required architect designed housing um, uh, that had a maximum capped cost. Um, it could be eligible under criterion A with a period of significance that extends well into the 1970s. On the lower right is uh, Sound 80 Studios in Minneapolis. It was built in 1970-71, um, and we'll see a little bit more about it later, but it is the home of the Minneapolis Sound, and it's also significant for its association with Prince. Um, and I believe uh, Kristen Schaumler is doing a session later this week on uh, Minneapolis music, so be sure to catch that. And I've lost my ability. There we go. Criterion B, these are the significant people of our past, right? Uh, so think about the people in your communities from the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, where were they living? Where were they working? Um, keep in mind, not only does a person need to be significant, but so does, um, they have to have gained that level of significance when they were associated with the property. And in some cases, that means the property is, is older um, than the, the recent past. But because we're talking about the recent past, you also need to know that the National Register strongly discourages nominating properties that are associated with the living persons. Um, here's some examples. Um, and on the left is uh, the Miller House in Columbus, Indiana. It is actually listed on the National Register under Criterion C. Obviously, a beautiful mid-century modern design. It's an era of Saarinen, late 1950s. But the, the property owner was uh, J. Irwin Miller. And he was a prominent Indiana businessman who lived in the house until 2004 when he passed away. He founded the National Council of Churches and the Cummins Foundation, he was extremely active in the Cummins Foundation all the way into the 1970s. And he was instrumental in making Columbus the architectural showcase that it eventually became. I'm going to bump down to the lower right, uh, another Prince property. <laughs> Um, and remember, I said I didn't ever want to preserve a 1960s tract house. Well, maybe this one. Um, it was built in 1957. Um, Prince lived here from 1965 to 1972. Um, and it's eligible because it's where he mastered piano, he learned guitar, and he began songwriting there. And on the upper right is the Crystal Cathedral campus out in Garden Grove, California. Now, this is something that you're going to look at and you're going to go, well, obviously it, it has architectural significance, right? Um, we have two nitro buildings right here, uh, the 1961, the low slung building right in the forefront. Um, behind that is the Tower of Hope, another nitro building, 1968. And then back beyond is the Crystal Cathedral, which is Philip Johnson in 1980. And then um, again, Philip Johnson in 1990, the Prayer Spire. Also on this campus is a Richard Meyer building from 2002. So definitely has architectural significance, but all of this is also associated with Robert Schuller, who some of you might remember is a, uh, was a televangelist who was well known for the Hour of Power, which was actually broadcast from here. Um, so this is undoubtedly significant for its architecture, but it might also be significant under Criterion B. Uh, keep in mind the National Register doesn't require significant significant people to be non-controversial. Um, every time I've brought this up in presentations, people kind of give me a strange look. Schuler, Schuler might be significant. <laughs> he might be significant. 
criterion C is always the easiest with the recent past in my mind. Um, it's, it's the architecture and art. Um, I just wanted to remind you to look beyond just individual high style buildings. Um, on the left, we have PD Plaza in Minneapolis, which of course is a very significant landscape um, designed by M. Paul Friedberg. And it is listed on the National Register under criterion A and C. On the upper right is the University of California, Irvine. So these happen to be two 1965 buildings. Um, they're William Pereira buildings. And he was the, the master planner slash architect for University of California, Irvine, all the way up until the 1980s. And so that entire campus was meant to be distinctive architecture um, starting in the 1960s all the way until today. They have buildings out there now from uh, Robert Ann Stern, Brent Gary, Maya Lynn, James Sterling. Um, and when I was in Iowa, we had a similar situation with the University of Iowa campus. The whole idea was to have these, these beautifully designed, distinctive buildings of architecture as a way to woo people to come to the university. On the lower right, I'm going to leave Mount Zion in. It's a 1956 building, so that's technically mid-century modern era, but it really was ahead of its time. That's an Eric Mendelssohn design. Um, it's his final building, and it's not listed individually, unfortunately, um, but it is within uh, the West Summit Historic District. Now, everyone kind of gives me a strange look when I put up a Criterion D slide for buildings. Um, and those of you who saw the mid-century modern stuff that I presented a few years ago at Preserve Minnesota would have seen this slide then. Uh, the two build buildings on the right are actually mid-century modern and earlier. And then the Insculptic on the left there is a Minnesota building from uh, 1969. So although typically Criterion D is used for archeology, span I want all of you to kind of think outside the box when it comes to the recent past, because it can be used for buildings as long as the building is the principal source of information. Um, as an example, log cabins are sometimes listed under Criterion D because the building is the principal source for understanding how the logs came together and the chinking and the, all the, excuse me, the materials that were used. So think about that in light of design build architecture of 70s, 80s, and 90s. And Sculptic on the left was built by a professor and his students. It was intended to be experimental and blend into the landscape, but it's also using relatively new building materials, fiberglass, PVC, spray foam, plexiglass. It's a true design build project from the 1960s and 70s. The Nemaxian House on the upper right, although it's a museum artifact now, if that were still out in the landscape, um, it was a prototype design, and if it was still out in the landscape, it would be perfect for analyzing how the, the building uh, patinaed over time. Commonwealth in the lower right, the Equitable Building uh, in Portland, was, it's actually a 1948 building. Um, it's the earliest example, uh, known example of international style commercial architecture in the US. It's also a very early example of heat pump technology. And yeah, all of that's written elsewhere. But if you wanna know how that heat pump technology is gonna work over time, that building is the only way you're gonna find out um, how that happens. And that's information potential. See, this is where I'd be looking out in the, in the room to see if you were all with me on it or not. You'll have to let me know in your comments later. Criteria considerations, I leave this, um, we're all familiar with them. Um, remember that the best way to deal with criteria considerations, including that 50 year rule slash myth down at the bottom, the properties of the recent past, the best way to address these in National Register nominations is to develop a sound historic context. That 50 year rule is a myth. You have to demonstrate exceptional significance um, by developing a context that's adequate enough to help you prove it. PD Plaza, which we saw, Cedar Square West, Sound 80, all three Minneapolis properties were listed in the National Register at well under 50 years of age because their historic contexts demonstrated their exceptional significance. So what does it mean to evaluate a property within its historic context? Well, you can't really take an sculptic 
and then compare it to say St. John's Abbey, which we just saw on the previous slide, you have to be able to compare apples to apples, right? So for properties of the recent past, make sure that your contexts address not just significance, but the necessary integrity for uh, listing. Think about the multiple property documentation form and the need for context as well as registration requirements. And that will help you get past the, the so-called myth, the rule, the 50-year rule. So now I'm gonna show you a, a property that if you, again, if you saw me a couple of years ago, you would have seen uh, Abraham Lincoln School. This is how you uh, create a historic context. These are the questions on the right that the Park Service recommends you answer. As you answer those, think about the levels of significance, so local, state, national. Areas of significance, are you only looking at architecture or for schools, education? You could be looking at military history or commerce with other properties. And be sure to look at periods of significance as you are developing your historic context. So I like using Abraham Lincoln School in Brooklyn Park. Um, I've used it in previous presentations and I'll probably continue to use it until we have an adequate context to, to actually evaluate it architecturally. Um, it was identified as part of a transportation project and evaluated by Mead and Hunt, um, the consulting firm. And uh, it was a tough one for me because I really wanted to see this eligible, um, but we just don't have enough information. It's a 1973 school. It replaced a 1920s building. It was designed by Bissell, Belair, and Green, who were designing a ton of other uh, educational facilities throughout the Twin Cities in the early 1970s. Um, in the end, we had sufficient context to evaluate its significance or non-significance under Criterion A in education, but we really didn't have enough to evaluate it under Criterion C. So it's nearly 50 years old, but, but it's truly unique. Um, Little research has been done on its architecture, and unfortunately we had to say not eligible because we didn't have enough context developed. Um, I, re I recommended that the building be reconsidered when we have a better understanding of the, the architecture. Um, just a few notes on that. Um, one of the, the conversations that we had over and over again is what style is it? It might be brutalist, might not. Um, it might be organic. Um, one of my colleagues called it the squishy marshmallow, so we thought about developing a new style called marshmallow architecture. Um, but if you can't define what that architecture is, it's hard to place it in context. And there truly are no other comparables. Integrity. Um, you've all seen the seven aspects. Again, I want you to think about them in light of the challenges I presented earlier, especially when it comes to design and materials and workmanship. You need to think about integrity differently for architecture of the recent past. We have materials that are mass produced. They're prone to failure. They're experimental to begin with. Um, and that was very common in the late 20th century. By having a historic context that actually talks about the relative importance of integrity aspects, you'll have better luck. So I'm back here at Sound 80, which was researched and nominated to the National Register by Kristen Schaumler. Um, just last year. It was built in the 1970s. It's home of the Minneapolis Sound. Um, there's Prince connections here. Uh, it's, it's listed under Criterion A for its significance as a recording studio and for its association with Prince under Criterion B. Um, the most challenging integrity issue on this property, the entire exterior wall cladding failed. What you're seeing, well, behind the vines, what you're seeing is not what was the original exterior. Cladding. But we weren't nominating the property under C, we were looking under Criterion A. So Kristen proved its importance within the context of Minnesota or Minneapolis music history. And then we made a case that talked about how it is sufficiently integrity. Um, the overall exterior form hasn't changed. Uh, despite the failure of the exterior cladding, the overall appearance remained unchanged. It was very simple lines and a very simple material on the outside. And despite the changes on the inside, the interior essentially retains its configuration. And again, simplified forms. Um, the most significant studios, studios one and two, were still recognizable, even if there were changes in the other ones. 
thankfully, while we were working on this, we also were working on the multiple property documentation form. And we put quite a bit in that form about how integrity can be a little different for certain properties. So I'm just going to use the last few minutes here to talk about the, the up and coming styles and uh, many of you know, I have a problem with categorizing buildings by style. <laughs> it's not like architects are going to say I'm going to design in X style. They, they have their own whims. Their clients have their own whims. The banks who are funding the projects have their own whims and they're influenced by what's happening around them. What they're seeing in architectural magazines or at conferences or or their colleagues and things like that. It's also difficult to categorize recent past architecture because often the styles are still in use and they're still evolving. Um, so I like to, pre I, I prefer to think of recent past as a movement. Um, eventually with sufficient perspective, we might be able to look back and start to throw things into buckets, into categories. Um, and you'll see in, in these examples that some are a little bit easier to throw into a bucket, into a category. Um, but these are just a few recent style um, movements, recent past movements that are coming into the forefront. There we go. New formalism, uh, 1950s, 60s, 70s. Um, it's an evolution out of mid-century modernism. Um, especially the international style. It has classical elements that kind of foreshadow uh, the emergence of, of postmodernism, which we'll see in a minute. Um, some of the characteristics, they're, they're freestanding, they're high profile, they're public buildings. Um, they have colonnades that lead to a projecting roof line, uh, smooth wall surfaces. Uh, they're typically symmetrical on the front. Uh, ornament has cast stone, metal, concrete, glass. Uh, on the left, you see the Northwestern National Life Building, uh, which is, let's see, 1965 by Minoru Yamasaki. That's here in Minneapolis. And on the right, we have a couple banks. The one on the upper left, or upper right is down in Spencer, Iowa. And the one on the lower right is a listed property. It's an East Stuart Williams property down in Palm Springs. Postmodernism. You all know the one on the, one on the left, right? <laughs> Postmodernism, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of started in the 1960s. It was really popular up until the 1990s. Um, it is still being used today for some designs. Um, it's commonly considered the brainchild of architect Denise Scott Brown and uh, Robert Venturi. Um, that's the Venturi house down in the lower right hand corner here. It was seen as a, a revolt from modernism and a return to historical styles with a modern bent. Um, FOMO, postmodernism, was an extensive movement that is still being studied, um, and there's numerous variations and subsets of the style. I, I imagine that um, this may be subcategorized further as we get, gain more perspective. Some of the characteristics, uh, modern interpretation of historical styles, forms, colors, features. Historical elements are made with non-traditional or unusual materials in some cases. Ornament is often fragmented. It's that decorated shed that Denise Scott Brown and, and Robert Venturi talked about. There's asymmetry, there's unsteady forms um, and illusion or campiness or colossi. Look at that huge um, roof line on the, the central part of the Denver Public Library. Um, that's definitely a unsteady form and, and colossi in the, a modern sense. Brutalism. Um, brutalism was popular, is commonly associated with the 1970s, but it actually ranges all the way from 1940s to today. Um, it's considered brutal in the harshest sense of that word, but um, the name actually comes from Beton Brut, uh, which means raw concrete, meaning simply unfinished concrete. Um, it's often used for government buildings, universities, housing complexes, some of the characteristics, it's, it's typically concrete, but you can also have it in brick, stone, and glass. Um, the structure is often exposed. It's uh, often geometric, it's heavy. Uh, windows are often simply deep voids in the wall, like you see in the, the lower right with the Boston uh, City Hall. Um, and the grouping of functions that is expressed on the exterior. 
Um, the property on the left there, you probably recognize Cedar Square West, Riverside Plaza, 1973 by Ralph Robson. And upper right is um, uh, Ross Hall at Iowa State University. It's a 1973 uh, building. Deconstructivism, when I was in architecture school, deconstructivism was all the rage to study. Um, we had to look at it as precedent for just about every project that we had. Um, it was extremely popular in the 80s and 90s. Um, it was inspired by Jacques Derrida, um, his, his literary concept of deconstruction. So he and Peter Eisenman, who did the Wexner Center for the Arts on the left, kind of got together and uh, this style came out. Um, it's an architectural concept. It is seen as a challenge to postmodernism. Um, instead of embracing classicism, however, it just tries to deconstruct it. Um, it wants to throw all the tenets of modernism out the window. So form doesn't have to follow function here. Uh, function certainly doesn't follow form. Um, and they really don't care if brick is the brick. <laughs> Um, it removes all the rules and, and systems. The characteristics, there's lack of ornament, um, lack of symmetry, lack of order. It's sometimes called controlled chaos. Um, geometry, solids, voids, lines are all popular. Uh, so is fragmentation or cuts or slices. Um, and there's often visual variations, deconstruction of, of common uh, or seminal works of architecture. So Wexner Center for the Arts is a deconstructed castle. Can you see it? See that huge slice straight down the middle? That's that's very, very common um, use in deconstruction. As I said, that was Peter Eisenman. Um, that's 1989. On the upper right is the Museum of Pop Culture, which I still want to call the Experience Music Project. Um, that's Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry is, is uh, a, a very important deconstructivist. Um, designer. Uh, the Museum of Pop Culture is supposed to be a, supposedly a deconstructed guitar. And then on the lower right is the J. Pritzker Pavilion in Millennium Park, another Jerry or Frank Gehry. It's 2004. And um, I look at it as deconstruct deconstructed music. Um, uh, and you can see the, the sound waves. Um, and it's beautiful, beautiful um, uh, pavilion. Metabolism was never very, very popular. Um, it's from the 1960s and 70s. I see it coming back. Um, so I don't know if we're already having a resurgence in it, but these are these are both buildings from back in its original um, days. Uh, it's a Japanese architectural movement. It became very popular with the 1970s World's Fair in, in Osaka, Japan. And it is all about the prefabricated parts, the concrete um, pods. Looks like, you know, all those things are just kind of stacked on each other, right? They were. <laughs> it has grouped functions. It uh, allows for the organic growth of the structure um, and often a quick growth of the structure. On the right, of course, is, is Marina uh, City in Chicago by Bertrand Goldberg. That's 1964. Um, and it's often considered um, part of the metabolism movement, although it's a, it predates the, the Japanese movement a little bit. But you can really start to see how Functions get grouped in this one from retail on the bottom to parking and, and housing above. Another popular style that's still around today and, and dates back to the 1960s, um, high tech, also known as structural expressionism. This is another one that I think is going to get recategorized as it continues because it is still in use today. Um, it has origins in British architecture. But there are lots of examples around the world, including here in Minneapolis, which you see on the left. Um, it integrates high tech and uh, technology industries into architectural design. It's a movement that promotes advances in materials, structures, um, and construction methods. It's often steel or glass or concrete. It's all about transparency in some cases, mass produced elements, repetition, with the idea that things can be replaced quickly. Um, as I mentioned, the Federal Reserve Bank on the left, um, Gunnar Binkert's, uh, I remember coming up to see this when I was in architecture school. It was considered one of the most amazing buildings uh, in Minneapolis uh, in the 90s. We were looking at it as precedent. It was built in 1974. 
it is not eligible for listing on the National Register. It has some uh, interesting additions. Um, and the, the structure is no longer structure, which is kind of sad. On the right, I throw in just to make it cringe a little. Um, I kind of like it though. It's the Hearst Tower in New York. It's a, a Norman Foster design from 2006 and it is on top of the Hearst Magazine building, uh, which is a 1928 design. And I'll close with organic again. Um, and Sculptic is back there on the lower right. Maybe the Abraham Lincoln School is organic, maybe, I don't know. Um, but I'm gonna close on this again because it's still being used today. Um, organic architecture is, is something that has probably uh, always existed, right? Um, the term is often associated with Frank Lloyd Wright from the early 1900s. Um, the philosophy is that every element of the building is designed. Um, it's related to each other, to the occupants, the landscape. Um, and characteristics, you can take it from whatever area, era you're looking at. Um, it takes forms from the environment, so wooded areas or plains or whatever. Um, it takes materials from the environment, timber, granite, etc., adobe. Um, it connects interior and exterior, and it often has high-tech or experimental aspects. Um, I mentioned in Sculptic down on the lower right, that foam dome home in the upper right is from 1979. That's in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, last I saw it, it was painted black, so it didn't stand out so well. Um, but dome homes were very, very popular um, back in the 70s, uh, and this is a foam dome home. And the Casablanca Motel, uh, it's one of my favorite in Palm Springs, California. It's a 1970 um, renovation of an earlier motel by Hugh Captor. Um, and I see a lot of connections between this and that uh, Abraham Lincoln School. Um, but Captor looked to the Adobe architecture of the Southwest when he was designing that. Um, so I went through a lot of those pretty quickly. But it's just to say, you know, categorization of, of architectural design from the recent past, including these movements that are still in use today, will continue to evolve. Um, we always need to embrace styles that we uh, often think are, are truly unlovable. <laughs> I, for one, am, am now trying to figure out how we're ever going to embrace the, the commercial grade color block condo architecture uh, that's out there today. And I'm going to pass it off to Frank Butterfield, who's going to give you some case studies um, to help you get ahead of the curve on preserving the recent past. Thank you so much, um, Barbara. Let me just share my screen here and start that. Did that work? Success? Thumbs up? It did, Frank. Thank you so much. Um, so as as Barbara mentioned, um, I'm going to uh, um, highlight some advocacy and education uh, relative to the recent past in, in my presentation. Hopefully, give a little whirlwind tour of of some projects, mostly in Illinois. Um, I should say I'm Frank Butterfield. I, I, I'm the chief operating officer for Landmarks Illinois. We're the statewide historic preservation nonprofit organization. We are in our 50th anniversary, as you can see from our our logo there. So just to to jump right in. As Barbara noted, um, you know, we, we, we use this term, the, the recent past and, and you know, um, many of these sites that you, you might categorize in, in uh, under that term uh, we, we see here are already over 50 years of age. All of these would be um, and there's that that 50 year rule, which I'm glad she noted, you know, just kind of it's, it's sort of. Um, not not uh, not worth as much sometimes weight as give as given to, to it, but just I wanted to sort of. Um, uh, uh, note that, that, that some people think of that 50 year rule and, you know, that 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 date moves forward in time as we all do. Um, and then you look at, you know, things that would be still younger than 50 and we get, you know, as, as Barbara noted, the postmodern here um, uh, throughout Illinois, it's Rockford on the left and Springfield um, and I think Effingham down in the bottom right. Um, but uh, largely, I, I worked uh, my, my my previous previous role at Landmarks Illinois was uh, uh, doing like field services throughout the state and a lot of um, especially smaller communities. But I'd say all, all over the place, really, you know, post World War II, people are still putting in a different bucket than um, than the early 20th century, late 19th century stuff, especially in Illinois. So I uh, just I'm going to highlight a, a couple things. I just I want to kind of put in your mind uh, that that uh, you know some of the the things to be thinking about with tools really isn't all that different from what you would do with uh, um, 
a, a older, uh, more traditional um, uh, preservation advocacy project. You know, we're, we're talking about the economics of, of these issues, environmental impact, and trying to bring solutions to problems, not just making a case based on um, significance alone. And, you know, uh, recent past also really provides a great opportunity but it can be an opportunity for any project to, to lean into storytelling, uh, relevancy, and, and sort of layers of history that are in these communities that we we hold so dear. And and you look at some of these these, these photos here, the the um, O'Hare Rotunda there in the top, you might be like, oh, beautiful design. That's 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 going to be significant for its architecture, and, and it most definitely is. But I just want to put a little pin in that one, and and we'll we'll come back to it right at the end. So a couple a couple of case studies. One one of the biggest ones in which Landmarks Illinois was involved, together with partners at Preservation Chicago, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation, among others, was Prentice Women's Hospital in 1975. You can see it there on the left. Architect Bertrand Goldberg, which which Barbara noted, as on the right there. Um, people who are fond of, um, uh, especially Chicago music, might know it. Uh, might know Bertrand Goldberg's work from uh, Marina City there uh, on the, the Wilco album, uh, but uh, Prentice Hospital in uh, 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 a little after 2000 was, was threatened by um, demolition from its owner, Northwestern University, um, who was going to demolish it for a, a new uh, uh, research building there. Uh, everyone has an had, a, had an opinion on this building, has an opinion on this building, um, just being you know space age or, or, or weird or odd, it made it into the local paper there with car cartoonists. Um, but I always think of my my cousin who um, who worked down there and was not terribly fond of the building. Um, and I asked him to describe the building to me, as you can see here. And he's like, oh, it's got these lobes and these oval windows. And, and I was like, OK, now describe another building uh, within a block radius of, of that. And he, he really couldn't do too much at all just because a lot of the, the new styles going up were were a little bit more uh, plain. So. At minimum, I could convince him that uh, uh, this is memorable. Um, as this threat emerged, again, this coalition got to work together, and I want to hit that solutions-based advocacy where um, we were showing how the building could be adaptable through reuse studies, whether rehabbing the building largely as it is in the, on the bottom right there, or potentially adding you know, more um, square footage through uh, an adjacent tower on, on the left there. So thinking about, you know, not just this is significant uh, for its modern design, it's early in uh, 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 computer uh, drafting, but uh, but really showing how it can be used in the future. Um, so corresponding floor plans there of how it could be adapted. And then, you know, really tapping into uh, the culture too, where this was at the time is 2000, probably eight, I'd say. Um, uh, Mad Men was a, a, a big deal at the time, um, hosting a uh, fundraisers and engagement opportunities and uh, you know mad men themed events there but nothing also can beat you know your traditional traditional rallies uh, t-shirts um, and there was also a design competition here I, I think you're noting you know, a lot of coordination a lot of uh, effort uh, uh, collaboration between partners went into this effort um, there's one of the rallies on the left and as, as I noted um, as we hit into relevancy and sustainability and climate change uh, the idea of just taking buildings, throwing them wholesale in a landfill is, is you know, uh, I think going to only continue to be an uh, increasingly resonant point. And you, you know, you know, you've made it as an advocacy campaign when you start having your building appear as someone's tattoo. So, uh, just include that as a little note there that um, keep your eyes out for if if you're if you're engaging enough people, maybe your your buildings will appear on their arms. And then for full transparency, I will note um, I, I that little. Uh, chunky uh, uh, redheaded baby in the middle there is yours truly. I was born in that that hospital, so you can take everything I said and say he's 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 biased. He's he was born there, which which would be true. Um, ultimately, this was unfortunately a loss. I you know you can you can turn to the the silver linings um, that, that that just again how much it resonated with. Um, the people of Chicago and beyond that across the country and ultimately Marina City there on the left was uh, designated a, a local landmark. So at least um, a Birch and Goldberg iconic design such as that was was protected. Along just I'm going to hit another icon here uh, currently ongoing. Um, was getting uh, actually text about this building as, as we were uh, about to come on the. 
the, the panel today, but the, the James R. Thompson Center, also known as the State of Illinois Building, 1985 government building in Chicago. This is one that the state of Illinois has been uh, talking about for years to sell and really kind of marketing it as, you know, look at all, you could put a high rise there. Um, and again, a, a building that everyone, as appropriate, it's a government building, we all have ownership in it, has an opinion, whether it's, you know, save it, it's worth, um, um, uh, the legacy of civic engagement and architecture to, um, uh, is this one of the ugliest buildings? Apparently, I think this was financial times, which is interesting that they're, um, pontificating on style, but, um, people have lots of opinions on these buildings. What, what you can't deny is just the, the remarkable space. Um, you know, when it's being featured on the cover of books, um, it's, 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 it's definitely something to take note of landmarks. Illinois has highlighted several times on its most endangered historic places list, but you're seeing that the news coverage there on the right to call attention to it. Again, solutions, we want to not just say this is a great building, save it, but we worked with the original architect, Helmut Ian, um, to come up with some re reuse renderings, which might be a little not traditional, but you can see here on the left is a way to get to that square footage by adding on to the building uh, a, a super tall structure or perhaps opening up the atrium. Landmarks only commission these renderings of, of those designs. Unfortunately, you might be aware the architect Helmut Ian was was killed in a, a, a bicycling accident just this this past summer. So uh, just even more significance for, for the building for a, a master architect like Helmut Jan. A, a lot of engagement, um, uh, whether through uh, Preservation Futures, you see like a, I think around Halloween time, their dress up, there was um, a, a little model of it built that was filled with ideas of what to do with the Thompson Center and then and then smashed uh, and, and podcasts, like a conversations from the food court down below in the, in the lower right. And just uh, just recently, Bonnie McDonald, president and CEO of Landmarks Illinois, participated as a jury uh, on, the, on the jury of uh, uh, the 2021 Chicago Prize competition. This is Chicago Architecture Center and Chicago Architectural Club coming up with you know design ideas, uh, soliciting design ideas from anyone who wanted to contribute. Uh, here's one uh, a finalist where uh, turning that atrium into a, a public pool, which is always kind of fun. So I should I should note uh, what, what's going on now is there's this been nominated to the, the National Register with criteria G exceptional significance uh, because the state owns it we are receiving a little pushback so we're, we're um, it, we we navigated through the the state review board but are are, are fighting and just kind of staying on um, the state to forward that to the National Park Service for their review because so we want to keep you know uh, recognize the significance and also open the door to, to tax credits. I'm not going to linger too much on 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 Farnsworth House, just another icon, Mies van der Rohe. You know, you you really have an iconic design when 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 Lego is making a, a model of your building. But Landmarks Illinois National Trust came together um, to uh, prevent uh, this building from potentially even being moved to a different site, and it's it's saved. Uh, but with with um, speaking of climate change, future issues there in the top right with with flooding. Uh, but that's another one. Um, where it really resonated with with the people this this something that makes Illinois very unique in, in Plano, Illinois. I want to kind of move to a smaller town down south in, in Carbondale. Uh, the the uh, Buckminster Fuller Dome Home um, uh, it was built in 1960. Uh, uh, Bucky Fuller was uh, a professor at Southern Illinois University from 1960 to 71 and lived in this home. It's the only geodesic dome that design for which he's known that that he he lived in with his wife um, Anne Hewlett. Um, uh, I think I think it's pictured uh, there. This is a. a uh, you know, Bucky was significant for um, being an architect, an author, uh, inventor, a futurist. Uh, but the the building had hit rough times by the 1990s, um, and you know, it had been used for like student housing for a bit, and just uh, was in rough shape when a nonprofit formed. Um, worked, you know, obviously the iconic design, but leaning into that story of of Buckminster Fuller, um, the geodesic dome, the worldwide influence of, of Buckminster Fuller and making the case there and, and through you know local engagement but also you know grants through uh, uh, landmarks Illinois on our most endangered list um, you know work got underway to to repair that building um, you can see the, the cute there uh, a home for your Buckies uh, as a, a fundraising jar there as uh, as Buckminster Fuller you know plays around with his uh, one of his designs there uh, this was a like a, a superstructure that was built, another geodesic dome on top of the building to protect it during some repairs. 
um, Landmarks Illinois continue to work with with the group. We partnered with Kennedy King Community College in Chicago uh, on a film project called People Saving Places that we, we debuted at a big event, bring awareness to the home. Um, there was also a local events. So you can see one of the Dymaxion cars was was brought from out of state. Uh, one of Bucky's designs to drive around. Uh, it's like a big sort of hot dog. I don't think it's terribly steady, so please don't bump into it. I think it might tip over. Um, but uh, anyway, this building is now uh, rehabbed and 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 reopened and and used for use by that nonprofit and a lot of educational opportunities. I just also want to highlight survey as as an advocacy tool. It's hard to know you know what um, what uh, we might be working on if we don't know what's out there. Uh, Landmarks Illinois we've partnered with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago for a number of years to do a survey of non um, uh, non residential. Uh, um, buildings in suburban Cook County, focusing on like 1935 to 75. And here's some just um, examples of um, uh, of different designs throughout that area. We're working right now on a, a preservation issue in Oak Park, uh, which is a building that was, was captured via the survey. I also just want to note like, um, to, to make an emphasis on interior tours uh, and education uh, when you're talking about the recent past, a lot, as, as Barbara noted, sometimes the buildings might be a little less lovable, some of those concrete ones from the outside, uh, but getting inside is really where, you know, there's a lot of playful uh, spaces. Here in Belleville, Illinois, uh, there was a local modern architect, Charles King, who did a number of homes, and they've done some tours uh, where they, they get... Um, several homeowners to open up their homes for tours and really has gotten great attendance from across the state. This is pre pandemic uh, when these were happening, but also you can see here from whether it's the Thompson Center, get inside that atrium space and just let it soar before you. But even the Illinois State Bar Association building the top right uh, in Springfield uh, designed by Walter Netch for Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, you know, a concrete building. I wish I could either blow that photo up giant or get you there in person, but you know, a lot of the, the detailing on the exterior is the concrete, how it was, you know, hammer finished and that texture, which is very intentional, although the passerby might just be like, ah, concrete. Uh, but you get them inside too, and you see that that stair, you know, arrangement and the, 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 the how, how he's playing with space really can help make the make the case for these types of buildings. But I also want to note, um, Drilling it down to to you know where people are, whether it's like uh, whether it's a you know modern modernism on Main Street, for example, uh, where uh, what 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 people have in their communities. Uh, Anthony Rubano here of the State Historic Preservation Office did a number of tours, uh, focusing on downtown Springfield, highlighting you know the the 1920s bank there in the top right with a 1960s addition, uh, you know kind of talking to uh, the, the bank, the the, the modern columns. Or the postmodern late 70s, what's the Willow and Birch Salon there in the bottom right, um, with its with its bay windows, um, in in kind, in 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 compatible with with its late 19th century neighbors there, to the to the right, uh, but um, helping people see how their community has has evolved, has grown, has changed over time, and that that can that be can be parsed down to a single building, you know whether. Um, uh, you don't have to have these pure pieces of architecture. Uh, storefronts are often changing. So you have a conversation in one building with the 1910s, 1910s and uh, early 1800s to the, the here are the 30s and the, the late 1800s um, and, and the 50s and the 20s that these are all historic uh, and, and different um, reflecting of different styles, even in a single building. And that doesn't stop with with the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. Here we have uh, a 1980s intervention into an early 20th century building, um, a high tech or postmodern style. Um, you can see uh, that um, a little glimpse of red there. And when this initially would have been built, it had much more of a, a pop there. You can see with the, the high tech red fire engine red popping out. Um, this is one that's near and dear to my heart when I live in Springfield and I keep an eye on it because it's been vacant for years. And you, you, you worry that um, someone's going to tear it out someday. Uh, I just I, I wanted to note that um, the storytelling theme is is a lot of what we talk about with Route 66, for example. Um, it's uh, you know a lot of sometimes what we call kitsch or um, uh, you know ephemeral, just a vernacular architecture or signage, uh, but it's really the stories that that drive it there. That's you can see Paul McCartney 
driving down the, the road going to some random gas station. And it was noted um, in the newspaper when talking about that travelers, international visitors, they want to experience something unique, something one of a kind. And that was from the Illinois Office of Tourism at the time. Uh, and and landmarks and again bringing resources to try to find solutions when the night spot cafe was threatened with condemnation and demolition bringing in an architecture firm an engineering firm to to demonstrate that the the building was structurally sound and could be repaired and you can see one of the events there happening in the bottom right but also this, this relevancy that the layers of history uh we've partnered with root history a uh, a nonprofit based out of springfield um uh, and we're partnering them on a, a green book project to survey the different sites associated with the, the green book, which was published from the 1930s to the 1960s uh, to help black travelers navigate um, throughout the country, but including Route 66. Um, and Route History um, has a mission to tell the, 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 the tragedy, the resilience, and the excellence of, of uh, the black experience, especially in Springfield, but throughout Illinois as well. And so, Working on the green book, we might have older buildings, but with that mid century um, relevancy, uh, given the, the, the experience of the African American uh, motorist uh, vacationer uh, traveler along the road. And just, I want to highlight partnerships. Uh, we, we couldn't do what we do if we're, if we're not collaborating with lots of different people, whether it's the park service, like the scenic byway here, route history, um, Illinois office of tourism, our state historic preservation office. That's in the department of natural resources there and, uh, getting that word out here where we, we held a, um, a tour for our, our, this is our member of Congress. Uh, Rodney Davis, uh, Congressman Davis failing to make the, the belt ring. Apparently there's a trick on how you hit it. I did not even try myself. But um, wanted to, to, to kind of get close to wrapping up here with a couple just um, stories of, you know, uh, hidden hidden treasure sometimes with the Ebony Jet uh, um, Was going to be converted to residential, which is great to have um, a new use in what was a vacant building at the time. But just with that conversion came, um, it was going to be the loss of the the test kitchen. This is where the recipes that would appear in the magazine uh, for Ebony Jet would um, would appear, and uh, it just could not fit in 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 the layout. Um, Landmarks Illinois worked with um, uh, volunteers, partnered with we we. Uh, our, our Skyline Council, which is our, our, our Council of Young Professionals, took this project on and uh, basically documented it and deconstructed it, and we put it in storage um, while uh, we put an RFP out, a request for proposals for, for different times in Chicago Tribune, among other venues. Ultimately, uh, the Museum of Food and Drink uh, in New York City uh, was going to have an exhibit uh, featuring this uh, as part of um, dining experiences uh, for uh, uh, focused on, on, on black culture and heritage and, and have it travel throughout the US. The pandemic put that out a little on delay, but that's still the intention uh, going forward. Also wanted to note, you know, here we have a building, a building not not recent past. Uh, this is in Chicago, um, but this does this is listed in the National Register um, for its connection to the artist Roger Brown, who um, had his as his home and studio from 1974 to 1995. Uh, this this has significance uh, for. You can see the way um, that was the, his home, how he, how he lived, and it was donated to the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, but uh, hidden in, in, in uh, you know, under the layer of that more traditional building is a more recent past story. Again, tapping into that layers of history and relevancy. One last concluding uh, a bit of news in August, uh, Landmarks Illinois announced its Women Who Built Illinois database. Um, so this was to catalog um, women architects, developers, clients, uh, basically all women who affected the built environment and 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 looked at uh, all the way back from 1879 to uh, 1979, um, capturing, we want a database of all all uh, those largely undertold stories. You know, on the right here is uh, Georgia Louise Harris Brown, um, who was did structural calculations for a, a number of buildings, including um, 860 North Lakeshore Drive, a Mies van der Rohe building, but very uh, prominent, and uh, these stories are largely weren't told. Um, and and when we think about um, 
the evolving story of preservation, uh, some of the uh, uh, stories of people who were excluded uh, are people who were then only were able to work later in time, our more recent history. And so the recent past is going to be critical to uh, sharing those very important stories. I told you to put a pin in that that rotunda building just because this is a building and more importantly, an architect, Gertrude Kerbis, who was featured in that survey. Uh, yes, significant for architecture, but much more significant too with the story of her experience and 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 uh, uh, working in that space at that time in a very male dominated uh, industry. So I just want to say thank you. Um, hopefully, uh, Jenny, we have some uh, time for for questions. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for that that that, that um, barnstorming tour through Illinois advocacy of the recent past. Barbara, Frank, thank you so much for both your presentations. They were um, informative and delightful as always. I'm not seeing any questions thus far. Um, so I might take this opportunity to thank you both for plugging context and survey as important ways to help identify and understand your historic properties. Um, there is nothing to say as as a member of your state, your Minnesota State Historic Preservation Office, there's nothing to say you can't identify something that was built yes, yesterday. Um, we are welcome to, to see it and know that it's there and have you um, analyze it and consider it in any way you feel necessary. Cannot make just, any promises about the outcome. <laughs> just to highlight that that the, those context studies too, um, and I think I think we're gonna um, see and and see the the importance of those growing through time too. Just as as the the field um, uh, sometimes will will continue to to maybe not move away is the is the wrong phrasing, but grow and and welcome more. Uh, uh, those stories that aren't evidence just in the architecture, um, things like a, a windshield survey just won't cut it. And, and to 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 dive into the community and 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 uh, and work uh, with uh, local members there to get those stories out and those context studies and and uh, you know see what buildings, including the recent past, are are should be targeted for preservation. And even if you don't have the the means to do your own context statement and do that research, you can contribute to the efforts that other people are doing. I'll put a link in the the chat. Um, if I can figure out, there we go. Um, this is to uh, Doka Momo, uh, Minnesota, um, who is collecting information about uh, modern architecture in Minnesota. Um, uh, they have a uh, re register that they're they're putting together and all of that information can come into the story. So um, I'm I'm bound and determined when I have tons of free time to go try to find squishy ar marshmallow architecture elsewhere in Minnesota. Um, this is where I would start looking because it's it's uh, you know buildings that have been collected. We don't necessarily know the history, but they're standing and we might have pictures and things like that. So take a look at Dokomomo. Um, and uh, both the Minnesota and the US chapter. And another interesting way to collect information, uh, the Society for Architectural Historians has a, um, a, a website with tons of information. So this link is to deconstructive, uh, <laughs> deconstructivist architecture. Um, but another place where you can just go and look at pictures and learn about buildings. Um, and all of that feeds into that context that you need to build those cases for national register and local designations. Um, and Frank, I, there was a question in the chat specifically for you. Um, uh, one of our participants asked, "What schools does Landmarks Illinois work with for the survey project?" That's uh, that's a project uh, that's uh, we we partner with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so their graduate program in historic preservation, basically once one semester a year, has been doing a survey for um, suburban Cook County. It's been going on for. Uh, maybe 15 years now. I mean, I'm just looking at the gray hairs where Jenny and I just both went went through it there. We we did it in 2009, <laughs> eight, nine. My mom um, <laughs> and uh, and it's it's just one where you know a, a survey is is it's so important. And um, you know by the time that one's done, we should probably be looking at uh, taking that the the years, extending them out because that one was 1935 and 1975 and you know, 75 is what, 40, 46 years um, uh, ago. So it's not, you know, there's a lot of important stuff built after that. I can credit the School of the Art, School of the Art Institute in that survey class with my uh, 
introduction to modernism um, and coming from South Georgia and South Carolina, the work that we were seeing in, in the greater Cook County area was new and different. And I sort of rolled my eyes of it. And now I look back at past Jenny and think, you're silly. <laughs> this stuff is amazing. <laughs> um, I had the same so, issues with postmodernism, Jenny. I, it took me a while to embrace it. Uh, and, I'm and I already I'm joke that we're going to, I'm going to list a McMansion before I'm done. <laughs> um, but so um, I, I appreciated uh, Frank and Barbara, you both talking about working with the community. So with regard to um, recent past, as well as other sort of less documented uh, histories specifically, it's always really important for us to get out into the community and make sure that we are not sort of academics um, telling people what's important to them. So to that to that point, Frank, for for those of us that either work in smaller communities where we don't have access to some um, nonprofits like Landmarks Illinois or um, some of the other larger institutions that can help us uh, bring awareness to things, who in the local community is a place that maybe we should get started with partnerships? Should we look at our Chamber of Commerce or or things like that in those in smaller communities where we're trying to work on the those Main Street Modern programs? Yeah, yeah, it's um, uh, it, it it's, it's hard to answer because it varies community by community. You know, I I have ones where the city government is really engaged and um and active in in uh, uh all the different neighborhoods and involved, and that would be the place w with whom I I work there. There are some where the really strong neighborhood organizations where um you know it takes time to build up those relationships, let them lead the process, you know know when to be in a support role and, and, and when to, you know, uh, offer, um, you know, what what toolkit, uh, hopefully growing toolkit we might we might have. Um, but it, it, it does vary from city governments to, to Chamber of Commerce, as you mentioned, to uh, neighborhood organizations. Um, we have, you know, some Main Street organizations or Main Street-ish organizations. Um, every community is a, a little different, um, and so we just try to, Again, not uh, as you noted, not come in uh, with that academic approach and make any pretense of saying what's significant, but letting the people who have lived and 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 enjoyed these places lead that conversation. I am seeing lots of praise in our Q and A. A fantastic job, nice nod to survey, um, very good presentation on an important topic of our field. But I'm not seeing any other questions, so I guess you all covered it without holes and everyone's ready to run out and discuss postmodernism with um, with their local um, advocates so that they can uh, go forth and save everything made of concrete. Is that what we're thinking, y'all? Because that's amazing. You know, I had a, a classmate uh, in, in graduate school who said that every building should be protected until it's proven that it's not worthy of protection. Good. Um, so you're here. It that way. I, uh, we had an advocacy issue in Springfield where they were proposing tearing down four blocks in the downtown for a university presence. And uh, in, in one of my evening, just uh, just uh, the absurdity of it, I created a Google overlay of all the parking lots in Springfield, and they are vast. And it, it, it made the case both for not doing that. It was really resonant with the community, but also, Barbara, to your point of for, forget historic, not historic. Springfield's at a point where every standing building should be considered an asset and make <laughs> the onus should be on, you know, demolition in any instance. I, you know, this could be just the most plain building, but we don't need another parking lot in Springfield. Um, there was, um, so one of our participants did pose a question that I think is a real, um, sort of a, a real can of worms. And I think it's important that we begin here understanding that we only have about 15 minutes and left in the ses session, but, um, as preservationists, how should we go about changing our mindsets about more recent history? This person just finished their degree and we talked so little about more modern buildings that they feel slightly overwhelmed in thinking about how to list a split level with vinyl siding. Um, could either of you discuss the resources that you use when, um, that, or that you used before this was all just steeped in your brain um, when trying to identify and understand the significance of these properties? Um, are there are they available to the general public? Or are they locked in the SHPO offices somewhere? Uh, there is stuff out there. Look at the National Park Service website. I always people have a lot of criticism for the outdated nature of a lot of the National Park Service bulletins and things like that. But if you're looking at split level 
uh, vinyl siding, you know, go grab that residential suburb uh, bulletin and, and take a look at it so you can just start to get to know what the history of the resources are. Um, that's how you change your mindset. You have to kind of build that historic context within your head. I mentioned that I, um, I'm still struggling a little bit with postmodern architecture. Um, as I've, you know, continued down this path, I've decided to study it more closely. And I look at it from an architectural point of view. I studied architecture in undergrad. I'm not an architect by any means. I'm not licensed, not nothing. But, uh, but I have that perspective that I can, I've, I've been able to dig into postmodernism a little bit more and try to see the, the context of, of how it came about. Um, so start with some National Park Service uh, bulletins um, and resources. Like I said, those, those historic contexts um, that I showed slides of, um, at least then you start to learn about the history of the era. And once you start to learn about the history of the era, that naturally kind of moves into what the properties are that might be significant. So those are things that are readily, readily available online. Obviously, um, SHPOs have context available and there's, there's tons of, of you know, architectural style guides. They go up to 1950, if you're lucky. <laughs> um, so those aren't gonna be as, as, as helpful, but there are some resources out there that you can look to. And, and go check out the Society of Architectural Historians um, Archipedia, um, because you can just you can just kind of get lost in there looking at at buildings and um, um, see what's cool. The city of Minneapolis did do if if uh, you're here in Minneapolis um, a recent document, um, Minneapolis Modernism, Mid Century Modernism. It doesn't quite go as far up as we're discussing here in the recent past, but it does create a lot of context um, and discusses a lot of those themes, those areas of significance that Barbara was mentioning, specifically transportation and the LGBTQ community and the um, the music. And there are many, many things that the State Historic Preservation Office can offer you with regard to context. Yeah, um, yeah. Don't reinvent the wheel. You know, the Minneapolis context might help in some ways. There might be other communities out there that are doing similar things. Um, if you're part of a preservation commission and are involved in NAPC, the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions, get in on that forum, lift serve, and, and send out some, some questions whenever you're having questions, because commissions are dealing with this all across the country. Um, communities are dealing with it all across the country. Uh, I put in the, the chat box a link to the Minneapolis Modern. Thank you. I was trying yeah. to do that as well, but could, can't talk and type at the same time. Um, the I would like to put a plug in for the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, we are, as humans, very interested in preservation. Um, so please, if you have questions, if you are wondering what's out there, give us a call. Um, our inf contact information is on the SHPO website. Um, you are welcome. I'm Ginny. You're welcome to contact me directly, even if you have nothing to do with National Register nomination because you're interested in what we've got out there. Our system is not as high tech and user friendly by the public uh, right now, specifically during during the COVID shutdown, but we are interested in giving you the information that you want. So please uh, feel free to contact us. Um, if you if you know of a building that you find interesting, if you're interested in something very specific. Um, I can't always guarantee a same day turnaround, but that's our job. So we're happy to be here for you. Um, it's 218. Frank, Barbara, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we um, move out of this chat and the Q&A? No, I'd say just open your minds and, and go explore because that's the best way to learn to embrace the unlovable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, you know, I, would, I would, from an advocacy standpoint, um, kind of to echo what Barbara said, don't, 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 don't try to reinvent the, the wheel, you know, the, the Economics are going to resonate. Um, you know, stories that go along there are going to resonate. Um, you you still have to be find solutions and and uh, and make the case. It's just you might have to make it the case in a slightly uh, different way. Um, but uh, it's 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 worth doing just because there you know we're going to lose a lot of these places before. Um, uh, maybe there's um, large scale hugs of these some of these types of buildings. Well, thank you um, both for for coming and sharing your expertise. Thank you all for joining us for this um, this presentation. I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference going on for the rest of the week. And um, don't forget that a 
copy of this will be available on the SHPO's YouTube channel um, after the completion. I'm not sure of the session or of the entire conference, but certainly soon. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all at a different time, hopefully in person sometime soon. Thanks so much, y'all. Thanks, Jenny. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.